the target year of our seminar series. Our, our very first seminar was on uh, September 12th of uh, 2003. And here is a tweet from uh, Stephanie Butland, who is one of the uh, organizers uh, for WANBUG. And uh, in her tweet, uh, she says that in 2002, uh, the human genome was not fully sequenced. There was no such thing as a bioinformatics seminar to be had in Bailey Al. And uh, to put this in context, uh, 20 years later, as of March of earlier this year, there is a complete gapless uh, assembly of a human genome. Our, our Van Buck organizing committee consists of about uh, 14 members. Uh, we are led by three faculty members, uh, Dr. William Zhao, who is in the audience today, uh, Dr. Amy Lee, and Dr. Faraj Kash. And uh, currently, there are about uh, 11 volunteers uh, in the organizing committee. And we welcome anybody who's interested in joining us. So feel free to talk to us during the networking session later. Um, for upcoming events, we have two seminars scheduled for October 20th and November 17th. Uh, for December 8th, uh, we are uh, currently undecided at the moment because there are a few things that we need to finalize. Um, so to stay in touch with us, uh, please uh, sign up to our low volume mailing list. And um, to find more details about VanBug, uh, you can uh, check our website at www.vanbug.org and um, follow us on Twitter. And we also have a YouTube channel, uh, which uh, currently has uh, many videos of past seminars. Um, so if there are any speakers that you will that you would like to see in our future uh, seminar of Vanbug. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a local speaker. So it could be any international uh, speakers that you are interested in. So um, uh, go to the contact page of our website. There's a link that says suggest a speaker. It will bring you to our Google form, which you could provide uh, details about uh, the speaker. Uh, VanBug is proudly sponsored by graduate studies in bioinformatics at UBC and SFU, uh, Genome BC, Canadian Bioinformatics Workshops, Imagia Canaxia Health, Langara College, Stem Cell Technologies. VanBug is uh, also affiliated with ISCB, MonBug, and TorBug. Uh, Montbuck and Torbuck are uh, our uh, sister groups in Montreal and Toronto, respectively. And um, we are very happy to have invited Dr. Jeffrey Schiebinger uh, to speak to us today. Uh, he is an assistant professor in the Department of Mathematics at UBC. Uh, he received his PhD in statistics at UC Berkeley in 2016, and he did his uh, postdoc at the Broad Institute at MIT and Harvard. Uh, he has also received uh, many awards, and most recently he has received the 2021 uh, Momentum Prize in Genetics, and this award is uh, being given to uh, the highest ranking CIHR project grant. And uh, today, uh, he will talk to us about two words of mathematical theory of development. So please join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Schiebender. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. So please bear with me.
mute here. There we go. And share screen. Um, just the desktop seems fine. And um, PowerPoint. And view. There we go. Okay, that seems sufficient. <clears throat> okay. Good. How is how is everybody? Good. Um, yeah, so I am excited to tell everybody about this um, this mathematical theory of development that um, that I've been working on. Um, I just um, just spoke with some of you a minute ago um, at the the course, and you know here we are for round two. But um, for all of those of you on on YouTube, I guess this is being posted, so I'm excited to tell you as well, um, and for the audience here as well. So um, if you think about um, developmental biology, it's it's you know traditionally, I guess, less mathematical than other areas of science, right? So, so if you compare to um, um, even something close by, like, you know, evolutionary biology, right? So, so there's a long history of, um, you know, in, in population genetics and in, in um, you know, even probability, people think about branching processes as giving a probability model for speciation, and you know, based on these probability models, you can infer a you know a maximum likelihood evolutionary tree, um, given some you know genomic data, or you can infer um, you can infer you know from a bunch of viruses. You can think about you know the the common ancestors and you know the, the spread of viruses based on um, you know the genomic sequences. So anyway, but developmental biology is is relatively less mathematical. Um, what, what I'll present today is, you know, um, is a set of equations that can be used to describe development, okay? So, um, and now in principle, we have, you know, developing organisms are made of molecules, atoms, these atoms obey the Schrodinger equation. So in some sense, we have, you know, already a set of equations, which on the other hand are meaningless because, you know, these, these, Organisms, which are you know this big, are comprised of an Avogadro number of you know atoms, and um, it's just you know impossible to compute anything if if you just start off with the the Schrodinger equation, right? It's just it's just meaningless. So um, on the other hand, I'm going to give a set of equations that work at the level of cells to describe development. Okay, and this will be actually. Um, very closely related to to, uh, to Waddington's epigenetic landscape, but um, it will actually give something that um, that we can use to you know to um, compute developmental trajectories from single cell RNA sequencing data, and um, we'll we'll learn you know through the course of this talk how to how to model a um, a developing organism with you know a curve in the space of probability distributions. We'll see uh, how um, single cell RNA sequencing can give you know, data along this curve. And then we'll see how we can use something called optimal transport, which is going to be you know, the source of these equations. Um, we'll see how optimal transport can be used to connect these dots to give us kind of straight lines in the space of probability distributions here and, and recover those de developmental trajectories. And then if time permits, at the end, we'll see how you know, we can extend this to other types of measurement technologies, like for example, um, it, you know, incorporating lineage tracing. Okay, okay so let's, um, let's dive in, right? So, so you know, this is a, a very biological audience. I don't need to you know, explain this or motivate this so much, right? People here have probably heard of single cell RNA sequencing, but just to you know, set the scene here, right? So, you know, our bodies are made of 20 trillion cells and, you know, all the different tissues in each, in, you know, are, are fundamentally comprised of cells. And these cells achieve very different functions, but with a common set of genetic codes, right? And it, it's kind of miraculous how this all happens, right? Um, you know, you have muscle cell, neurons, skin cells. These are all, these are all achieving very different functions from this, from a common set of genetic 
uh, instructions. And th this, you know, these genetic instructions can be decomposed into genes, right? So a gene is, some, as you know, something that produces um, RNA, and there's roughly 20,000 of these genes. And this, this kind of gene expression profile that you could get by, by um, looking at the gene expression levels, you know, how many molecules of R RNA are there for each gene, um, this is one way to define the state of a cell, okay? So, and we'll think of development as a process where, you know, populations of cells change their state continuously over time. So we, we, and, and this gene expression will be one example of cell state, but we'll, we'll think also about other examples of cell state. And, you know, we'll really think about it abstractly. Um, cells will be moving abstractly, defining trajectories through some abstract state space. And um, we'll want to try to recover those trajectories, which are actually possible to measure directly. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, so just a bit more about how, um, it, how these measurement technologies have progressed, right? So, so here's a picture of the brain. Um, we're seeing here, you know, this, the beautiful, um, you know, surface of the cortex. The brain is trying to maximize surface area, so it's wiggling um, over on itself. And um, at each point, you know, we have red, green, and blue. So we have RGB pixels, right? And the, the level of red, green, and blue are showing the expression level of three different marker genes here, where neurons are, are tagged in red and astrocytes are tagged in green. And, you know, these are achieving very different functions. Um, and we're characterizing three of their, you know, 20,000 dimensions through this, this measurement technology here, right? Um, we're capturing the level of red, uh, the level of red, the level of green, and the level of blue, which are the expression levels of three of their twenty thousand genes. Um, you know, we may like to see more information about these cells, but with these, um, you know, traditionally these fluorescence microscopy-based measurement technologies have been limited in the number of dimensions that can be profiled simultaneously. Now, this is kind of rapidly changing. Uh, people are developing you know, very sophisticated techniques to, um, you know, flash different color combinations and, and you know, um, you know, in this way probe, you know, thousands of genes with, um, in a spatial pattern with, with this um, fluorescence-based microscopy techniques. But the, um, you know, the technology that ushered in, you know, in around 2015, the era of you know, single cell analysis was this, this technique of single cell RNA sequencing. And, and you know, sequencing-based technologies in general are really increasing kind of the throughput at which we can look at you know, complex descriptions of cellular state at massive throughput, right? So, so in 2015, there was this uh, droplet revolution, as many of you know, where you can you know, take you know, a population of cells, grind them up, you know, suspend the cells, um, you know, it dissociate the cells, suspend the cells in liquid, put them through this microfluidic device um, and isolate individual cells in droplets, right? And, and by isolating cells in droplets, we can then profile the expression profiles um, of individual cells kind of in isolation. Whereas if you were measuring a group of cells together, like you would do, you know, in, a, in an older technology, like a microarray, you would then measure kind of the, the sum of the um, expression vectors from the different cells. What, what really is an expression vector? You know, by, by expression vector, we can think of, you know, some, some vector where in the first dimension, we record the number of molecules of RNA for gene one. In the second dimension, you know, we record for gene two and so on for each gene, right? So, so here's one example of a, um, a precise mathematical description of cell state, okay? Um, and you know, single cell RNA sequencing is just one example of a measurement technology, right? So you can also measure the three-dimensional structure of DNA with um, you know, a tax seq. You can um, measure the contact um, points of the, you know, the, the three-dimensional structure of DNA and see which regions of DNA are close with, uh, with high C. You know, there's all kinds of attributes of cell state. You, you can measure some of the proteins in the cell with, uh, with Cytoff. Um, and we're not, we're, we're going to abstract beyond that in this talk and just think about kind of cells abstractly as having some kind of, you know, state, which is changing over time. And we're going to think about how, how, how this happens, right? So um, just to 
you know, go along with the RNA example just a little bit longer, right? So, 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 um, you know, here's another picture of the brain, and you have, again, we have our two cell types, neurons and astrocytes here, and you know, so um, the neurons may have, you know, high expression levels of gene one and gene four, and the astrocytes may have high expression levels of, you know, two and three, uh, and any two neurons may be similar but slightly different, right? So, so the most basic thing you could, you know, think about doing with this data is survey the cell types in the brain, create an atlas, okay? And you could, you could try clustering the cells. And when you cluster, you know, the cells together, you, would, you may see a cluster for the neurons because they have similar vectors in this high dimensional space. And similarly, you know, the other cell types may all cluster, you know, e each cell type would form its own separate cluster, right? And then you could start analyzing uh, what makes these clusters different by looking at the, the, you know, differential expression between the clusters. And then we would see really, you know, here, okay, neurons have high levels of gene one and gene four. Um, and that's also not what we're going to do. We're not, we're not going to think about kind of this, this, um, in some sense, this is a static problem. You know, this is, this is what cell types exist at this time point. We're going to be thinking about in this talk, you know, how do cell types arise over time, okay? For example, embryonic development. You have the fertilized egg gives rise to the different tissue types that you have in an adult, right? Um, it could be anything though. It could be wound healing. You know, at time zero, you have, you know, you get a cut and then the, the population of skin cells, um, you know, develops in order to, you know, to heal this wound, right? It could be, you know, time zero, you go to the beach and get sunburned and then your, your, um, your skin cells need to respond by producing more, um, more melanin, you know, and you get tan, right? So, so any population of cells changing over time, okay? The classical mathematical model for this is, is um, Waddington's epigenetic landscape. Here, a cell is like a marble rolling through this uh, developmental landscape. Um, where there are valleys separated by ridges, and it's these, these uh, valleys that give rise to stabilized cell types, okay? The, the, curvature, the curvature at the bottom of the valleys prevents a cell from spontaneously converting from one type to, into another, right? Something like a, like a you know, harmonic oscillator in, in physics, right? So um, you have you know, one cell type in this valley, another cell type in that valley, and these two cell types have some common ancestor here at that little saddle point. And similarly, you have other cell types over here, which share some common ancestor, right? So, we're gonna think of these cells as points, like I said, in the state space. Concretely, the state space could be this gene expression space where there's a dimension for each gene, but it could be something else. Um, as cells change their state over time, they describe trajectories, okay? Now, if we could actually observe these trajectories, that would be great because then, you know, we could try to learn what does, you know, we, we could try to learn the shape of this landscape. And if we knew the shape of this landscape, we would have a better understanding of how um, cell types are stabilized in normal development and how they destabilize with age or in diseases like cancer. However, it's not directly possible to, you know, to measure these, it's not currently possible to directly measure these, these trajectories, at least, you know, in the context of single cell RNA sequencing for all of the genes, right? So you can, um, tag a few genes with fluorescent reporters in live cells and measure the expression profiles of these over time. Um, but these single cell measurement technologies are destructive. You know, for, for example, single cell RNA sequencing involves grinding up the organism, put, you know, uh, dissociating the cells, putting them in the chip and then, and then capturing the RNA. And, and anyway, the organism is, is beyond dead at the end of this, right? So, so, you know, in this cartoon here, we have one blue cell, which is giving rise to, you know, four descendants here in red. And it's not possible to measure both the blue cell and its red descendants. Okay, you can measure one or the other, right? Okay? 
what people can do though, you know, what, what we can do is leverage the fact that this process is reproducible, okay? So, you know, embryonic development, you, you start off with a fertilized egg, you get an organism, you know, with, with two arms, two legs, two eyes, two ears, right? Um, you know, unless something goes wrong, you have some, uh, some developmental disorder, but it's largely reproducible, right? So, so for example, if you want to, if you want to profile at three time points, you can prepare three separate, um, you know, versions of the process that you can, you know, fertilize three embryos at the same time or at different, and then profile them at different times. Okay. So, um, at time zero, you fertilize three embryos, you collect one at time T1, single cell RNA sequencing, you collect the second at time T2, it gives you the, you know, this point cloud of green cells. And in, then at time three, you observe the red point cloud, okay? So what you observe directly, what the data tells you is that this population exists at time T2 in green, and this population exists at time T3 in red. And then what you'd like to infer for example, is, is the connections between the time points, the trajectories, right? So for example, this subpopulation on the, on the right gives rise to these two subpopulations by time T3. So, <clears throat> and, and this subpopulation on the left gives rise to these two subpopulations on the left. You know, this is, there's a lot of work in this area on algorithms and techniques and approaches to recover these um, connections between time points on, on this problem of trajectory inference, right? And um, the focus here will be on rigorous guarantees. So can we prove that trajectory inference works or not? Under what conditions can we recover trajectories? Now, the motivation for this is something like, you know, um, you know, if we want to design medical therapies based on results that we learn from trajectory inference, then it, it's nice to have some guarantee that the information that we learn is, is correct, right? It's just similar to how, um, you know, in control theory, where you're, you're, you design an autopilot for an airplane, you know, control theory is a well-established field in, in, in applied math where, um, you know, if you have an airplane, there's some parameters there's some parameter space, you know, there's the roll, the pitch, the yaw, the velocity. And you can prove that if you're at some region of the parameter space, you won't go to a dangerous region of the parameter space where the airplane is upside down going toward the air, you know, going toward the ground very quickly, unless some extreme event happens, like it's struck by lightning or something like that, right? So, so there are these kind of um, rigorous, rigorous guarantees, you know, in that type of setting. And, and I'd argue that you know, in this, in this medical area, it'd be nice to have some, some kind of rigorous guarantees and rigorous understanding at least of when, when is trajectory inference possible and when is, when is it impossible? Okay. So, so um, many of, essentially all of the, you know, many approaches are essentially non-convex. What does this mean? I mean, if you try to recover this developmental landscape directly, or if you, for example, try to recover these kind of paths along the valley floors, which some, some approaches, you know, um, go for, right? You would have to somehow parameterize the potential and say like, what is the potential energy surface? What is the Waddington's landscape that best fits the data? Okay, and that approach, it's essentially impossible to prove that you get it right because you have to solve a non-convex optimization problem, and this is this is you know NP hard, right? So it's it's not um, it's it's it you know there's no proposed approach to to recover this landscape through convex optimization. However, we'll see that the trajectories can be recovered through convex optimization um, through an approach called optimal transport, and that's going to be the content of this lecture. So that will give us you know provable guarantees. We can prove that we can recover the trajectories. Now, the trajectories are very similar to the landscape. You know, a landscape defines a set of trajectories, right? Because if you, if you, if you have the landscape, then you're gonna roll downhill and produce trajectories, right? And then actually from the trajectories, you can ultimately, you know, get the landscape, but you, you know, you don't set off to get the landscape in the first place. And that's kind of the key 
key insight here is to go for, you know, directly for the trajectories. Okay, so what, what does this mean? Um, so a minute ago, we thought of a cell as a point in some state space. Okay, so here we're going to think of a, a population of cells, if you will, a point cloud as a probability distribution on this state space. Uh, so, so you know, here we have the blue probability distribution uh, at time t1 and the green probability distribution at time t2. And by time t3, there's been some, uh, you know, differentiation into two, you know, populations and it's becoming bimodal here, right? So um, now there's some connection between the time points. And this is the thing that cannot be measured, okay? So in mathematical terms, there is a, a, a joint probability distribution between the, you know, connecting these time points. Um, and this can't be measured because the samples that we obtain are independent. They're independent because in biological terms, they're, they're from different organisms, okay? You, you have one mouse embryo that you ground up at time T1 and a second mouse embryo that you ground up at time T2. And, you know, the blue cells and the green cells are from different, different embryos, okay? So, um, the goal here is to try to recover this, this uh, dependent structure, you know, in simple terms, given that you're here, where will you be at time T3? Or given that you're over here on the left-hand side, you're maybe you're more likely to go here to this left cluster. This is, you know, this, uh, this connection between ancestors and descendants, this object, um, is the uh, the transition kernel of the Markov process that we're going to try to recover. So, so it's a Markov process. That's an assumption. It means we're assuming that the process is memoryless. Okay. So this is in some sense a benign assumption because you know all the laws of physics are Markov. You know, the Schrodinger equation is Markov. You know, it, it means like the, the past is um, independent of the future. The future is independent of the past given the present. Okay. So we just exist in the present. Um, now this depends on your notion of cell state. Okay. So if your cell state is the gene expression profile, that's an incomplete description of cell state. So for example, the, the chromatin configuration could, you know, you could have the same gene expression profile, same number of molecules of RNA, um, you know, two gene expression profiles with different chromatin con configuration would have different future evolution, right? We're assuming here that we have a complete enough description of cell state that this memoryless um, assumption is reasonable. Okay, so how are we going to infer these connections between the distributions at different time points? We're going to use a classical tool called optimal transport. Uh, what is optimal transport? Well, this was, you know, this is a technique developed by uh, Gaspard Molge in the 1780s to redistribute Earth for the purpose of building fortifications. Okay. Now, you know, you can think of this, this pile of earth here in blue as a probability distribution. Okay. So there's some distribution of earth and you want to redistribute the earth so that you get the other, you know, th this, this green distribution. Okay. Um, in order to do this, you have to come up with a plan to redistribute, you know, wh where does this column of dirt go? Well, maybe it has to go there, right? And you want to come up with the most efficient plan possible because there's many possible plans, right? You could take, even if the starting and, you know, if the blue and green even were the same, you could mix up all the dirt in a complicated way and do a lot of extra unnecessary work, right? So, so anyway, so, so Monge came up with this idea to come up with the optimal transport plan. Um, and this was, uh, you know, so, so this line of work, you know, has a long history. It was generalized by Kentorovich in the 1940s to give rise to, to linear programming. Um, and, um, you know, this is kind of the, the foundation of um, mathematical programming and optimization and kind of machine learning today. So that's kind of the, the historical arc. Um, you know, people use optimal transport in all sorts of different areas of, you know, pure and applied math, computer science. Um, so, so, you know, here, here's a, an example from computer science where they're transporting the pixels, you know, piles of pixels, right? So you have, you have a cow 
and a you know a duck and everything in between. So you, so you can interpolate between shapes. People actually use optimal transport, you know, in in um, in um, computer graphics, like you know, to to interpolate between, you know, if you want, if you have, if you're in at Pixar and you want to animate something and you have you know, this position and this position, you know, so 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 you know the the stick figures, you know, the the, the animated figure is moving their arms, right? Um, a long time ago, like in the in the 40s, you know, at Disney they had, um, you know skilled people who would draw, you know, like, like comic book style, you know, here's this scene and here's the next scene. And then you can interpolate between those scenes. Uh, they would hire, you know, um, kind of less, you know, they would hire kind of um, in painters to draw, you know, 40 frames per second, connecting those two, you know, those two scenes, right? Um, but now, now, nowadays people can use optimal transport to interpolate between, um, you know, automatically between poses um, it's used in um, in pure math a lot um, in in partial differential equations. Uh, two of the recent Fields medals, which is like the Nobel Prize in math, are, are for um, optimal transport. Um, it's used in um, in climate science to to model the flow of clouds. Um, it's used in cosmology to model the flow of mass in the universe. So there's there's the distribution of mass kind of now and the distribution of mass at the Big Bang, which is uniform. And you can interpolate to get the distribution of mass at any time in between. Um, and you know, we're, we're going to propose to use it here to model developing um, populations of cells. Okay. So, so what is optimal transport? You know, so so you know, the little mini plan here is what is optimal transport, and then how do we use it? In a, applied to cells. Okay, so, so, um, optimal, so, so, so a transport plan is an object that takes mass and redistributes it. Okay, so if you have a unit mass here, this column at position x, represented by this uh, this Dirac delta function, this is transported to a pile pi, and this object pi specifies you know where this mass goes. Um, over all transport plans, the optimal transport plan is the one that minimizes the expected cost. So if it costs C of X, Y to move a unit mass from X to Y, and we move an amount pi of X, Y from X to Y, then if we add up all these infinitesimal costs, that's the, the total cost of transportation. Okay. Now, here in this, in this um, we, we've written the squared Euclidean distance, which is a nice option for the cost function. Um, so, so that's the cost function. And, and here we have the, the total cost. And we're going to minimize this subject to constraints. What are these constraints? They're basically conservation of mass, OK? So you know, the most efficient way to um, you know, it, it would cost zero for transportation if you could just throw away all the dirt and you don't have to transport anything, right? So, but you're not allowed to do that. You have to take all of this blue dirt and produce this green shape. So in mathematical terms, you have to come up with a plan such that if you add up over all destinations Y where the dirt is going, you get the starting distribution, okay? So if you kind of forget where it's going, that's the starting distribution. And if you forget where it's coming from by integrating over X, that's the, um, the target distribution, the green one, Q of Y. And, and, and pi is this mapping from a starting location to an object, you know, pi of X, and it has its second argument Y, and that's a probability distribution over, over kind of how much mass from X is going to each location Y. So that's the transport plan. And this it's this linear program. So it's a linear program because you know the objective is linear in pi, and the constraints are linear in, in pi as well. So here then are you know these are the equations about development at the level of cells. Okay. The the kind of hypothesis about biology is that this true coupling, which exists in nature. 
you know, which remember this true coupling says a cell with expression profile something will give rise to descendants with these expression profiles at this later time point. Um, so, so this exists in nature. The assumption or the model, the hypothesis is that this is approximated by optimal transport on short time scales. Okay. And, and we'll see in a minute that this assumption is kind of equivalent to Waddington's idea of an epigenetic landscape. Um, more precisely, you know, so, so here, if you think of this as a stochastic process, so it's, it's a, a stochastic process is a set of probability distributions that change in time, okay? So what types of stochastic processes have this optimal transport property in the sense that they're transition kernels um, you know, they're, they're Markov transition kernels, which you, you can, you know, push probability forward in time. Um, which stochastic processes agree with optimal transport? You know, their transition kernels agree with optimal transport on short time scales. And these are precisely, um, you know, it, it, they're stochastic differential equations where there is a Waddington's landscape. The stochastic part well, first of all, the differential equation part means that you're just going downhill according to some Waddington's landscape. Um, and the stochastic part means that there's some randomness. We'll see in a few minutes that this, this, this randomness allows you to have the concept of a stem cell, okay? In an ordinary differential equation, the paths are deterministic. From a starting location, you always follow one path. So you can't have a stem cell. Like, no, a stem cell from one cell, you get many different types of cells, right? A, a multipotent stem cell, right? So, um, okay, so that's the basic idea is that we're going to recover the connections between time points using optimal transport. And, and this is then something that we can compute on the data, okay? The assumption is happening kind of in this land of infinite data, you know, the true coupling agrees with optimal transport. Well, then, under that assumption, we can compute the optimal transport coupling on the finite data. And by the way, you know, we have the law of large numbers here. So as you get more and more data at time t1, you get a better and better estimate of the distribution of cells that existed at time t1, right? That, that's just the kind of the ordinary law of large numbers, right? Um, and so, so then, you know, you would get a better and better estimate of the optimal transport coupling and ultimately of the kind of the, the true coupling. Okay. So now in the space of, um, of probability distributions, you can kind of, it, it, you know, this picture is very different than the picture we had originally a, a few minutes ago of a cell and its trajectory, okay? We, we have to kind of expand our minds and think of, you know, a whole population of cells is a point in the space of cell populations, okay? So, so a whole population of cells, so as a population of cells changes, it's describing a curve in the space of cell populations, okay? Now, when you profile a finite number of cells with single cell RNA sequencing, you get an imperfect characterization of the population because you're measuring finitely many cells. Okay, so a mouse has 20 trillion cells. You do single cell RNA sequencing, you get 10,000 cells. That's an incomplete description of the whole mouse, right? So, so these empirical distributions that you get, if you did, you know, millions of cells at time T1, you get a point closer and closer to the true red curve here. And then at time T2, you know, the distribution has changed over time, and then you have another noisy measurement. And what optimal transport allows us to do is to connect these empirical distributions with straight lines, with shortest paths in the space of probability distributions. And that allows us to, uh, to recover this curve here. Okay, so two quick considerations. Um, so we said a minute ago that optimal transport conserves mass, you know, piles of dirt, don't divide, don't die. So there's an easy way to, uh, to modify um, you know, optimal transport to deal with cell proliferation. Um, and the second thing is that we're going to introduce 
you know, entropy regularization to allow cells to be, um, you know, more or less faded. Okay, so dealing first with, uh, with cell growth. So, you know, this is kind of one of the hardest things to come up with in practice. It's a little bit of an art to kind of come up with an estimate of the, the rate of cellular growth. But this is something you have to, um, have to do in this kind of um, perspective. Um, so, so if you think that the cell at position X is growing at rate G of X, you know, this will determine how much mass you put down at the later time point. So if it's growing at a large rate, you'll put down a large pile. And if it's growing at a slow rate or dying, you'll put down a smaller pile. So we can incorporate this in the optimization problem by um, scaling the mass coming out of position X by this G of X. Okay, so we'll then transport the rescaled distribution of cells from time T1 to get the distribution of cells from time T2. Okay. You know, another way to think about it is you give each cell from time T1 a certain number of tokens according to how many descendants it should have. And then you have the cells redistribute their tokens in order to um, minimize the transport cost. Okay, so, so now we'll talk about adding entropy. In the absence of entropy, you know, every cell would have kind of maybe only one possible place it could go. What we'll do and what we'll see is that it's beneficial to add entropy and kind of promote entropy in these couplings for several reasons. Um, it'll have the effect of, you know, avoiding overfitting in one sense, but then there's going to be this kind of deeper connection to the actual um, kind of stochastic differential equation modeling in terms of Waddington's landscape. Okay. It, just from the level of the optimization problem, adding entropy can be achieved by you know adding you know a single term to the objective, um, and this makes it you know it's not a linear program anymore. There's some curvature, and that's a nice thing from the the perspective of you know solving this numerically. You know the algorithm is then called you know um, it's called Sinkhorn's algorithm, and it's you know light speed computation of optimal transport. Right? So this is kind of a breakthrough in 2013 that. Um, you know, made optimal transport much more popular in machine learning because it, it, it speeds it up a lot. Um, yeah, so, so entropic regularization kind of plays three roles. Um, it, it, from a biological perspective, it, it controls the level of noise in the stochastic differential equation, which kind of prescribes how, you know, to what extent cells are faded. Um, from a statistical perspective, it avoids overfitting. And from a computational perspective, it, it um, speeds up the numerics. There's this fascinating connection between entropy regularization and Brownian motion, okay? And this is the thing that, you know, um, that we leveraged to, to get to stochastic differential equations, which have a Brownian motion bit and a differential equation bit, right? So, but this connection to, uh, to Brownian motion goes back all the way to Schrodinger, who, you know, was thinking about kind of um, indistinguishable particles, which arises in quantum mechanics. So you see kind of indistinguishable particles and here we have kind of, you know, four versions of the same picture, you know, particles, and you take a picture and you see the red positions at time t zero, there's six particles um, and six blue positions at time t one. And then depending on what you think the diffusion coefficient of these particles is, there's actually different paths that are likely, okay? So, for kind of a low diffusion coefficient, which here epsilon is the diffusion coefficient, there's basically only one possibility for the way the particles could have gone from the red locations to the blue locations. You know, all, the particles are indistinguishable here. The red dots all look red, the blue dots all look blue. So you don't know which red dot should be connected to which blue dot, right? So, so um, imagine, you know, experimentally, imagine you, you're looking through the microscope, you have, you know, six molecule, you know, six GFP proteins, and you take a picture at time zero, you walk away for 10 minutes, come back, and you take another picture of the six GFP proteins, but which GFP went where from, you know, from time zero to one, right? Um, so the theorem that Schrodinger proved is that there's this connection between entropy regularized optimal transport and Brownian motion in the sense that, um, 
it actually tells you the likely connections between the particles. <clears throat> okay, and the, the final, you know, I don't want to, the final bit is that we can use something called unbalanced transport um, to, to allow for misspecified growth rates, right? So, so if we don't want to impose these marginals super strictly, we can allow for some wiggle room if we don't know this G function uh, precisely. So let's um, see how this looks on some data. And, and um, let's see how this looks on some data. How am I doing for time, by the way? Should, should I stop in, in five minutes or something? OK, sounds good. OK, good. So um, yeah, we, we started a little bit late. So, so um, I'll try to wrap up in five minutes. OK, good. So one of the first systems we tested this on was um, reprogramming fibroblasts to induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, we collected roughly 40 time points over 18 days, so roughly every 12 hours. Uh, there was a period where we collected every six hours. Um, so starting from these mouse embryonic fibroblasts, you know, in this uh, two-dimensional visualization of the 20,000-dimensional gene expression profiles, you know, things are progressing you know, up and to the left, basically, right? And, and the color of each dot here, each dot is a single cell. The color of each dot is showing the, the time of collection. You know, so all of the green cells exist here at around day eight. All of the blue cells exist around day, you know, four. So which blue cell gives rise to which green cell? Which green cell gives rise to each yellow cell? You know, we used, we used optimal transport in order to make these connections. Um, and, and that was kind of a hypothesis, which we then tested in various ways. So, so you know, the optimal transport hypothesis is telling us that, um, you know, these induced pluripotent stem cells, which is kind of the goal of reprogramming is to produce these, these are coming along this thin string, you know, from this ancestral population and that ancestral population at the earlier time point and so on. Um, whereas the this uh, you know cells that are turning into stromal cells instead of successfully repro reprogramming, they're kind of following along the right hand side of this picture here. So we we have this uh, superposition of processes to all those different fates that we're kind of deconvolving into you know trajectories to the, each of these different uh, fates. You know, <clears throat> one way that we validated this was through something called geodesic interpolation, where we connect time t1 to time t3 directly, skipping time t2, saving that data, sorry. So we save that data just for a minute, and then we check how accurate that interpolation was. You know, so we, we stop them at the intermediate time point and check how accurate that was. And you know, the red curve here is quantifying the error of that interpolation. And we see that it's, basically as close as it could be to this green curve, which is a measure of the baseline noise level. How, what is this baseline? We repeat the experiment at time T2 and collect two separate independent data sets for time T2. Because there's finitely many cells, they're not exactly the same, okay? So we're kind of achieving, we're, we're achieving this baseline noise level here on these kind of later time points, also on these earlier time points, but it's not so surprising here because there's basically only one way to couple cells. Around day zero, the population is kind of unimodal here. So, so there's, it's not very hard to kind of connect the ancestor to, to, to the descendants because it's kind of only, you know, not, not, not much uh, diversity in the cells there. We saw that we could, you know, learn things about cell-cell um, interactions. So we predicted this interaction um, between a cytokine and a receptor in these different cell populations in their ancestral populations at this earlier time point where the fates were being formed. We, we, and we found that, you know, when we added the, um, the cytokine in, we actually got more stem cells. So, so it looked like, you know, these stromal cells were producing the cytokine the, uh, the stem cells have the receptor, you know, this TDGF1 is the receptor. So when you add it in, you, you, know, you, you get more um, successfully reprogrammed colonies. Uh, we've tested this in other organisms as well. We've tested this in a sea urchin embryonic development with collaborators at Duke, where 
we saw that we could reconstruct the classically known um, gene regulatory network in urchin, right? These, um, you know, Dave and Greg have been studying sea urchin for 50 years um, and have, you know, painstakingly learned, you know, that this gene turns on this gene and this gene turns on, you know, these, these other genes. And so, so you can read this like an electrical circuit diagram, right? And, and with optimal transport, we're able to recover the, the ones written in black font, right? So we focus on this time interval and most of them, you know, 18 out of 21 here are, are black. We're able to recover with optimal transport here. Now, I want to conclude by, you know, kind of reversing this, reversing the question and asking, you know, what can the theory do for the experiment, right? So how can this um, theor theoretical perspective help guide the design of experiments, okay? So, so we, we, we've learned to think about development as a curve in the space of probability distributions. And when we collect time points with single cell RNA sequencing, we um, are getting kind of noisy data points along these curves. They're noisy because we're sampling finitely many cells, okay? And the number of cells that we sample in a time point determines the noise level of that data point along the curve, right? So if we did, you know, if we sampled a million cells at a time point, we would have a fairly good estimate of the position of the curve at that time point. In this cartoon here, we're getting, you know, maybe a hundred time points with only a few cells per time point. So you can make an analogy. Uh, well, first of all, you, you know, first of all, the theory suggests that you should collect way more time points than people are currently doing. And it's okay to have an uncomfortably small number of cells per time point, like one cell per time point, okay? Um, or 10 cells per time point or something like that, right? So, so um, it, it, we, we can prove that, you know, as long as you have one cell per time point, as long as you get infinitely many time points, you, you kind of get the right answer. Um, so, so the theory suggests that you should, you could, should collect more time points with fewer cells per time point, right? Um, why is this a good idea? And how do you do this? Okay. Um, I want to make an analogy. Okay. So, so if you think about pre-2015, people were doing single cell RNA sequencing with plate-based approaches. Okay. So you had your 96 well plate and you would take, you know, 96 cells and profile their gene expression, you know, with, with very high accuracy. Okay. You would, you know, with, with SmartSeq2 or something like that, you would get a lot of reads per cell. Okay. And, you know, your data point, we've kind of gotten used to the idea of thinking of cells as our data points. You take your reads, fundamentally your reads are your data points. You aggregate your reads into cells. And then, you know, you, you, you think of the size of your data set is the number of cells. Really, when you're doing a time course, you should think of aggregating all of your cells into time points. And the size of your data set is really the number of time points you have. And the number of cells determines the noise level of each data point, just like the number of reads. You know, we're used to thinking of the number of reads as determining the noise level of our cells, okay? So when we went from plate-based single cell RNA sequencing to droplet-based single cell RNA sequencing, we accepted the fact that we would have, you know, fewer reads per cell. And the benefit is that we can get way more cells now. So with with droplets, we can do, you know, 10,000 in a 10x run. If we overload, we can get to 50,000 cells. If we do a few, we can have a data set with 100,000 cells. If we're doing split pool-based approaches, you know, there are some publications with a million cells, two million cells, um, and that's a lot of cells, right? You know, this theory is suggesting that we should do the same thing for time points. We should strive to collect, you know, a million time points or a thousand time points, right? Currently, people are kind of collecting time points by hand. Um, and it, so it's difficult to collect hundreds of time points. Um, but with some experimental collaborators here at UBC, and I, I'm showing here, you know, Nozumu and Kenji, but we also have, you know, Steve Plotkin here in the room, um, where we're testing in um, 
you know, we're, we're, you know, looking for funding to test in tinafores. Um, but, but we, you know, starting off with Nozumu and Kenji, we're proposing a strategy to collect thousands of time points with single cell RNA sequencing without having to touch, you know, thousands of embryos by hand, one by one by one. And the, the key idea is to do them all in parallel, just like when we do single cell RNA sequencing, we don't touch each cell one by one by one. We did with plate-based single cell RNA sequencing, with droplets, you process them all in parallel by introducing a cell-specific barcode. This cell-specific DNA barcode allows you to pool the reads from all the cell, you know, uh, pool the RNA from all the cells into one DNA library, which you sequence, and then computationally, you can assign the reads to cells. Here, we're proposing to use a DNA barcode for embryos. Now, this could be achieved in different ways. One really simple way to achieve it is with um, recombination. So you can take two you know, parents, mother and father, cross them. If they have a slightly different genotype, then all of the children through recombination will have a slightly different genotype. We're proposing to then read this out of the single cell RNA sequencing. When we're aligning the reads to the genome, we'll look for SNPs. Cells that have the same SNPs will be from the same embryo and we'll be able to group those cells into embryos. And um, in this way, we hope to be able to collect thousands of time points. And, and then, um, then, by the way, we're not going to have, we're, we're not going to, you know, it's not going to be a good idea to just connect each dot to the next, like we were doing with optimal transport. So our basic, you know, optimal transport um, approach will kind of break down there. But, you know, with, with collaborators in the math department, we've worked out this um, approach for regression in the space of probability distributions. So instead of just connecting each data point to the next, we, we you know, kind of estimate a smooth curve here. And, you know, you know in this paper, love not at all, um, this is this theorem that I was referencing from the beginning. And I'll, I'll just, I'll end on this. I'm a minute, I'm a, you know, a few minutes over time, but I, I, this is the last thing I want to say. So. Um, we have this theorem, and the theorem is as follows. So if the true process proceeds according to, you know, a Waddington's landscape, okay, diffusion plus drift, um, where, where the, uh, you know, the drift is actually, you know, a landscape, um, then in the limit of infinitely many time points, the optimal solution converges to the ground truth. Um, this diffusion plus drift looks like this. This looks maybe, maybe this looks a little bit scary. This is a stochastic differential equation. So, so here a cell state X at time T is changing in a way that's going downhill plus a random component. You know, and, and if this is the case, so, so if this is, you know, this is a very flexible model for how the trajectories are evolving. All it assumes is that a Waddington's landscape exists, okay? And it's smooth. So the Waddington's landscape doesn't have cliffs. Okay, a cl if you have a cliff, then the cells will change, you know, by a large amount, even on kind of infinitely short time scales. okay? So as long as this function is, you know, it's called C2. So um, as long as it's smooth, then, you know, then, um, entropy regularized optimal transport will, you know, kind of connect these dots. And in the limit of infinitely many time points, you get the right answer. And, and the really interesting thing about the theorem is that we don't require the data here to convert. We don't need the law of large numbers to kick in at the level of each time point. We don't need each time point to have infinitely many cells. All we need is one cell per time point. From a, you know, a more data-driven perspective, you know, here's some empirical evidence that you should have more time points, okay? The empirical evidence for more time points is as follows. So we see the same kind of picture in, two, in, in, in different studies, right? So we see a blue curve and an orange curve, and the blue curve is, is kind of worse than the orange curve in urchin and in stem cell reprogramming, totally different systems. What is the blue curve? We're... we're Along the x-axis here, we're downsampling the data set. We're throwing away data. Um, and we're quantifying 
how well we can interpolate here. Okay, so so when you interpolate, you connect time one to time three directly with a straight line and check the the, the length of this purple line segment. That's the y-axis. Okay, so as you throw away data, you go to half or a quarter or a sixth of the data. Um, you know this gets worse. We're throwing away data in two different ways here for the blue and the orange curve. Okay, for the orange curve. We're just throwing away half of the cells, regardless of what time point they're coming from. Okay, and this is actually not so bad. So the orange curve is kind of, you know, closer to saturation. You can actually go down to a twelfth of the data set, and the data set would have been twelve times cheap, cheaper to collect, and it wouldn't have been that much worse. Okay, now it's actually not, you know, it's it's really bad on the other hand to throw away time points. So if you throw away half of your time points or a quarter of your time points, things start to get worse really quickly, okay? So we're much farther from saturation in terms of the number of time points that we see. So, so this is some, you know, and we see a similar trend in these, in these different data sets, right? So this is, um, you know, this is some, some experimental evidence for this, for this um, idea that you should collect more time points, right? We're, we're nowhere near saturation in terms of the number of time points collected in either of these studies, even though this study here had you know 40 time points, which is kind of a lot. So um, yeah, so this, this is um, motivating our, our idea for collecting thousands of time points. Um, I think at this time, I've used up all of my time points in this talk. So I'll, I'll um, thank you guys for your attention and um, welcome any questions. Yeah. Uh huh. So, like the optimization problem, or the we have. Um, so here's the pile, and here's the optimization problem. Like this thing, this D here. Yeah, what is D? So D is, um, it, it means the mass at Y, okay? So, so don't worry too much about the D. It's like the same D as in DX, okay? So what is D, when you're integrating, what is DX? What does the D mean in front of DX, right? It's like um, something we write and don't think about it too much, right? But, but the, the D is kind of like density, okay? So it's like, um, so here we're saying, you know, how much mass is there? at y okay so so you know yeah this this is this is like um it, it's like the mass at y you know so 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 here if you integrate over all x you know you end up with a function of y and it should be the amount of mass at y so so if if this is um you know a um empirical so this so this empirical distribution is like, um, you know, if we have n cells, so so this p hat of you know t one is one divided by n sum of you know i equals one to n of so mass one on some points x i. So the amount of so, so so the amount of mass on point you know x seventeen is one divided by n. So, so, so there's, you know, there's, there's, um, but, but then, you know, at time t1, we're rescaling the mass on each point x by the growth rates. And that's kind of the, the crucial thing to take here is that, you know, you're kind of, you're giving each cell a number of tokens, which is like proportional to how many descendants it, it should have. And this is something you have to come up with. Um, so, you need to have some estimate of how many descendants the cells should have. That's this G. Um, and then you, you 
give cells, you know, so if this cell is going to have five descendants, it should have five tokens. If the cell should have one descendant, it's going to have one token. If this cell will die, it will have zero tokens. And then they redistribute all their tokens to achieve, you know, um, mass, you know, uh, you know, according to the next time point. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, ju just we didn't use any imputation. So at each time point, we're collecting, um, you know, a a few thousand cells, and um, then you you transport the data from one time point to the data from the next time point. Yeah, yeah. So in this picture, they visually look like they're in different places. Um, and you can, you know, you can do clustering and, and measure the distances between clusters and stuff like that and look for differentially expressed genes. And we're kind of labeling with them with these labels because, um, you know, these cells look neural because they're expressing some genes, you know, some, some, some neural signatures. Yeah, so things are getting more divergent as time goes. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess your whole point is if you measure people are kind of similar to each other, you have the poison data along the way. But does that, to what extent does like the number of genes you actually have or possible number of genes you have in the like, organism you measure by in that? Does it end up kind of making that? Yeah, so so your question is about the number of genes and how that yeah, influences. Like yeah, that's a good question. So um, we so so at the moment, we only have what's called a consistency result, which you know so so a statistical estimator is consistent if in the limit of infinite data it gets the ground truth. So um, what we're working on is quantifying that, right? And that quantification will allow us to get a precise answer to, um, you know, the experimental design question of, um, you know, if we can say with this many data points per time point, you get this error, then you can try to ask like, what will give you the least error? You know, so for a fixed budget of total number of samples, you know, the math problem that we're working on now is like, how can you, spread those samples out over the time points to minimize the total error. And that may depend on the dimension, if that's your question, I guess, right? It, like in certain settings, it may be, you know, one thing may be optimal and the uh, other settings, the other thing may be optimal, I guess. So in like, I mean, uh, part of the problem we're working on, like how to tell the distance between that yellow and blue point on that graph, so they're taking that time samples. Or I guess not the yellow and blue, but more like, um, so here we have the red curve, which is the ground truth. Okay, we have the data, which are the black dots. And then we have the reconstructed process, which is the green curve. Okay, so our, our recon, so, so, you know, how close is the reconstructed curve to the true curve? Okay, and, you know, in the limit of infinitely many time points, you know, R converges to, you know, the red one. Okay, green one converges to red one, which is good. And we only need one sample per time point for that to be the case. Um, but we don't know if one sample per time point is the best, right? Is it, does it, um, does it help you to have, you know, two samples per time point, right? Um, or three samples per time point, right? So... Um, so the number of cells per time point is kind of an idea of the quality, I guess, right? Um, and we're not even talking about the number of reads either, I guess, right? Um, which is another interesting way to phrase the problem, I guess, right? But, but, you know, one setting in which this would be very different 
you know, the, the, the answer to this would be very different is if you were also able to, you know, capture lineage tracing information, which is sometimes possible. So you, you can, um, you know, introduce these heritable uh, barcodes, you know, you know, so you can use CRISPR to make mutations in some artificial segment of DNA and then read this out at the end together with the gene expression profile. And then so instead of just measuring the positions of these cells in gene expression space, which you do with ordinary single cell RNA sequencing, you also measure the sequence of this um, barcode that's evolving. You know, so here's a mutation event where this original AAA turns into, you know, AAAT. And then that's inherited along this developmental trajectory. And then from these barcodes, you can try to infer the tree. And now for this type of problem, when you're measuring, you know, so at a time point, you would have cells and their tree, right? So, so here's a little cartoon of what two time points would look like. At this time point, you have two cells and the tree. And this time point, you have four cells and the tree. And the tree is kind of meaningless for two cells because for two cells, the tree always has the same topology, right? But there's different tree topologies for, you know, and it gets kind of exponentially complicated as you get more cells. So we think that in this, we think that if you're collecting lineage tracing information, you know, you shouldn't go all the way to just one cell per time point, because then there's no information in the lineage tracing, right? So from a mathematical perspective, I think there's going to be interesting kind of trade-offs in these different settings. It may be the case that, you know, in this vanilla setting, you know, one cell per time point is optimal, and then you should just go as close to that as you can, I guess, right? Um, but that may not be the case either, you know, and it's kind of, um, kind of unclear at this point. Um, yeah. Can you please go to the matrices? The matrices, like with the, this one? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Uh, here, yeah. So, as far as I understand, you're trying to understand the most probable trajectory of the Yeah. So, my question is uh, for a cell, um, do you also have a model to most effectively change its trajectory? For example, you have a cell in the blue, like blue, <laughs> that is expected to be a central cell, but you want it to be a normal cell. Right. What could be the effective way, maybe while changing the gene expression? What, what kind of model? Yeah. So, I, that's a great question. Yeah. And that's kind of the, you know, that's the, the, you know, holy grail, right? That's the real question to ask, right? So, so, I mean, like after you have trajectories, you know, you'd like to learn about some mechanism of gene regulation and then some kind of control theory of how to drive, you know, cells from one position to another. And, and um, I don't seem to have the slide here. This is something that we, um, we did to some extent. So we, um, we asked, you know, which genes would drive cells more towards stem cells, okay? Um, you know, so, so if you're here at, you know, this uh, intermediate time, day eight, uh, which genes could you additionally turn on to push you more in this, this stem cell direction? And, you, and you, you, you know, you could ask any variant of this, right? So um, in order to do this, we first computed the trajectories, okay? Um, and then what the trajectories give us is, is like training data to set up a machine learning problem to have a model for the evolution of where cells are going to go. So, um, it, we, we, we made a simple model like this. We said, you know, um, where the cell is going to go is a linear function of the cell's position. So, so like X dot, um, where it's going to go, it's a linear function of the position. And this is, you know, not super reasonable, but it's just a simple model, right? So, so, so this couldn't give rise to a Waddington's landscape with more than one, um, you know, um, valley, because like the, the valleys are where X dot equals zero. And if you have, you know, x dot equals zero, it's a zero eigenvector of A. And if you have two zero eigenvectors of A, then any linear combination is also a zero eigenvector. So you end up getting these like subspaces, which are, you know, zero eigenvectors. 
but you know we tried this and we we put some additional assumptions so here we said this this matrix was like low rank And each rank one component was sparse. So, so A is with some kind of sparse PCA. And um, okay, and what did that give us? That gave us, you know, some rough approximation to the vector field that is, you know, driving the trajectories, right? And then we say like, which vector do you turn on in order to go in a specific direction, right? So, so if this matrix A is low rank, A is like, um, you know, like U V transpose X. That's a, a rank one component of A. Okay, so this like um, is V trans. So, so X is like this direction. U V transpose is like this direction. So V transpose V transpose X. You know, when this is large, then you go in the direction U. Okay, so if you have if you have like a is a sum of u i v i transpose, and, and, and this is rank R. You know, each one of these is like a gene expression program, and it's turned on by these genes. And when it's turned on, it goes in that direction. Okay, and so we said like, um, <clears throat> you know, which genes would put, and and then actually we we uh, we we found some list of genes. And we, you know, we, we, our, our success rate was like one in 20. So we predicted a list of 20 genes. And one of those actually increased the efficiency of, your, of reprogramming. You know, so, so this was a, a cool thing that we, we found. Um, so this can be done, you know, done to some extent. Um, and I think this is like also a very important area for future research. Like what is the kind of the best way to do this? Like, you know, now that we have some some idea of trajectories, you know, how what is the best way to learn about you know gene regulation and control? Yeah, go ahead. So we came up with some list, of, you know, genes that might make more stem cells, and then we, um, you know, added them to this list. You know, so for each one, it, we we tested, you know, like like a fifth option as well, right? And um, in that list of 20, there was, there was another, you know, um, so, so one out of 20 was kind of the novel, right? There was another one that was known as well, you know, so, so the new one was called OCT4. Uh, sorry, sorry, no, um, Ob uh, OCT4 is here. Uh, the new one is called OBOX6, and there was some other one, ZFP42 or something like that, which was known, you know, known that if you add it to this list, you, you do better. Um, yeah, so that's described in our, in our paper, if you want to learn more, more about that, but um, there's, there's also another interesting way, maybe like a much more principled way to do this is to, um, is to start from the probability model, okay? This is, so, so you can actually in here, either in the noise or in this thing, put some model of gene regulation as your, your initial guess, you know? And, and then if you put, in this stochastic process here, some model of gene regulation, you can kind of improve what you're doing with optimal transport. And um, so, so there's, there's also a way to a, a approach this here. So, yeah. So hopefully this is a short and naive question, but uh, have people used this approach, or could you use this approach for for viral or, or some pathogen population as in like tracking of or population over time? And what what do you what do you need to do? To, what kind of data do you need? To do that? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. So let me um say let me yeah let me say a few things about that. So so first let me talk about a um kind of a separate but related, um, you know, application. Okay, so, so this is like in design of clinical trials, okay? So in clinical trials, you, you know, it's kind of hard to get longitudinal data, you know, where you have the same patient over years, right? Um, you know, you can imagine that there's a disease and then, you know, a patient is like a cell and it's gonna, uh, the patient will progress, 
And, you know, differentiation is like the, the you know, the, the patient's state could go one way, get better, or go the other way, get worse. You know, and, and different people can react in different ways and go to different, you know, final states, right? So, so, um, so the, um, the trajectory inference would allow you to, you know, kind of get pseudo longitudinal data when you don't really have longitudinal data, right? So, so you just observe patients maybe just once, okay? Or if you had some longitudinal data for a patient, that would tell you like they actually did go there. Um, but, you know, from this set of, you know, and, and, and what is the time? So you, you'd have to kind of synchronize all the patients by their time, which is like their disease stage. You know, zero is when they get the disease. And if they're at, you know, stage four cancer, stage five, or, you know, whatever, you have to somehow come up with a time for them. And then you could try to, you know, infer trajectories, which is like, you know, you know, this one would go here. And that one would go here, basically, right? So now let's talk about um, viruses. So, so in something like viruses, you actually have some additional information if you're, if you're sequencing the viruses in the sense that, um, so suppose you have a population and people are infected and um, you want to infer, you know, you have some kind of viral load distributed across the population at one time, viral load distributed across the population at the next time. And um, you want to infer kind of which person infected which person possibly, I guess, right? Or... Uh, it could be that or just... Uh, uh... Ignore the host and then just looking at all the viral genomes and then infer which one likely to survive on which ancestral. And people are, as you know, doing that using phylogenetic analysis. Yeah. I'm just wondering with this approach, given that you could, can you use, can you then treat, because for phylogenetic analysis, you're kind of treating each virus as a single, um, uh, like a, a, this is, uh, you're not able to treat it as a population, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Go to the other population. So I'm just wondering if this approach allows you to bring three, let's say you have some way of sampling um, a bunch of closely related populations using this way to, to infer the trajectory of the evolution of the population rather than just one or one, one instance or well, one organism. Yeah, that's actually really interesting. So I think like, yeah, I think phylogenetics is more designed for like, if you just have one time point, right? And then what is the tree from that? But if you're able to collect multiple time points, um, there could be, yeah, there could be some really interesting application there. Yeah, and I, yeah, we should, we should definitely talk about that sense. Yeah, like a fun area to collaborate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Jeffrey, again. And, um, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and stop the... Um...